You turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the ninth chapter of Isaiah. The ninth chapter of Isaiah, fairly well-known passage of Scripture that's read often this time of year. We read it at the Christmas Eve Eve service last night, and these words often appear on Christmas cards and very common passage. Prophecy of Isaiah, of course, Isaiah was living in the shadow of Assyria. Israel was about to fall and to be taken captive. The people of Israel refused to hear the warnings of Isaiah, the prophet who had been sent to warn them of impending judgment if they did not repent. Significant portion of this book is quite dark, but it's also filled with great hope as there are promises and flashes of hope that appear throughout as we get glimpses of this one who is to come, the suffering servant, the glorious king. And we read of him in Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. It says, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the lamb of Zebulun in the land of Naphtali. So Zebulun and Naphtali are in the region of Galilee in northern Israel, and they were the first to experience the, the oppression of those um, armies that would come in and take the people captive. And so they were shamed. Uh, they were the first to experience this suffering. And he says, in former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. That's what he's talking about. But in the latter time... He has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. So something's going to happen in Galilee, we're told. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as jo with joy at the harvest as they are glad when they divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior and the battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over His kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Matthew, of course, writing in his gospel many years later would tell us that this promise was fulfilled in Jesus. In the Gospel of Matthew, beginning in verse 4, we read this. Now when he heard, this is speaking of Jesus, when he heard that John, that's John the Baptist, had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in the shadow of death, of them or on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, if you go back into the prophet Isaiah and chapter 9, we are told that this one who was to come, whom we now know as Jesus, would be given several names, and some of the names are Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In the brief time that we have together here this morning, I want to focus on just one of these, and we could maybe next year in Advent, maybe we'll go through all of these names, but I want to focus on Prince of Peace. You remember in the Christmas story, the angels appeared over shepherds in Bethlehem. And do you remember what they announced? Glory to God in the highest and on earth what? Peace, goodwill toward men. Isaiah said two different times there in chapter 9 that peace would come as a result of this child. He is the prince of peace and of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. The concept of peace is one that is on the minds of many people today, 
It's been on the minds of mankind for, from the dawn of human history. Think about just our current time. Think of the international conflicts that are taking place right now. Many people, many Christians today are celebrating Christmas under great hardship, under threat of the sword. We have Israel and Palestine in conflict, Russia and Ukraine, China and Taiwan. And many of these, many geopolitical experts are saying that we could be on the verge of something akin to what happened in the 1930s and 40s with the Great War. International conflicts are raging and there's great fear. But there are also those relational conflicts. Marriages that are struggling, divorce, parents and children who don't talk, children, siblings who don't speak to one another. So much relational conflict. Neighbors who don't get along, church members who are angry with one another. And then there's the struggle of inner peace, the inner conflict, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideations are at near epidemic levels in this country, particularly among young people, which is ironic in light of the fact that we are the wealthiest nation in the world, the most advanced nation in the world, and yet we seem to be on par with one of the unhappiest. So what does it mean that Jesus is the Prince of Peace and what does it mean and what does it mean for us? What does it mean for all of these situations that we've just spoken of? Well, the Scriptures reveal that Jesus has come to bring peace and He has come to bring peace in three specific ways and I want to look at those this morning. The first is peace between God and man. The second is peace between man and man. And the third is peace in our hearts. We see peace with God as a theme of Scripture and in the story which Josh read to the children today, you saw that when when the, the man and the woman ate of the fruit and they were forced to leave the garden. The, the relationship with God was severed in that moment when they disobeyed God. God had only given them everything they could ever want. He had given them everything they needed for their everlasting joy, and yet they still rebelled against Him. They shook their fist in His face and said, we will go our own way and we will do things our way. And so they were banished from the garden. And as Isaiah would later say, your iniquities have have caused me to hide my face from you. But Jesus has come, and Jesus has come to restore that relationship, to bring reconciliation. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified, that's a term which means put right, to make right. So some of you young people here, uh, if you, well, older people, if you use typewriters, you remember what it meant to justify. Now we have word processors, and we all know what the word processors have. They have the three little sections of lines, and you can justify to the right, justify to the left, or justify both margins, right? To make all the letters equal on all sides. What does it mean to justify? It means to bring those words into line with the margin. So to be justified is to be brought right in line with a standard. God is the standard. We have been put out of sorts with Him. We have been in enmity with Him. We have been broken in our fellowship with Him. We were no longer aligned with Him. And Jesus has come to justify us, to bring us back into line with the standard, to make us right. And God has done that through Jesus' life and death and resurrection. You see, Jesus came to facilitate the cessation of hostilities between you and God. That's why He came. Things were out of sorts. We were, we were in trouble with God and Jesus has come to put that right. We have been justified. How? We have been justified, he says here in Romans 5.1, by faith, not by things that we have done, not by good works, not by our religious practice, but by faith, by trusting in what Jesus has done, not trusting in what we have done or what anyone else has done, but trusting in what Jesus has done alone. We don't make peace with God by being trying to be better trying to, to renovate ourselves. We come to a place of peace with God because Jesus has broken down that wall that existed between us and God. Romans 5.10 refers to us as His enemies. Genesis 3, which was quoted again this morning in the story, 
that there would be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of this man who was to come. There was this conflict, this eternal conflict, which was going to, to rage. But Jesus has come to make it right. That little baby in the manger is, if you can imagine this as Mary held that baby in her, her arms, the Christ child, and to think that just 30 some odd years later, nails would be driven through his hands and through his feet as he hung upon a cross. Why did he hang on that cross? He hung upon that cross because he was bearing our sin and our shame. We couldn't solve our problem, so God solved it. God came in flesh as one of us to die as one of us in our place so that we might be forgiven. In our place, condemned he stood, as the old hymn says. The chastisement, Isaiah would say in 53, the chastisement, the punishment that brought us peace fell upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. He came to die. He was born to die. And he was raised, Paul would say in Romans chapter 4, he was raised for our justification. When Jesus came up out of that grave, he left our sins in the tomb. He left our sins in the tomb. And if you will come this morning in faith, trusting in what God has done through Jesus, you too can be forgiven and free. You can be saved from the judgment that is due all of us for our sin. Peace between man and man. So peace between God and man. And then peace between man and man. So we saw this in the story again. You remember Cain and Abel. But if you go back a, a chapter or two in chapter 3 in Genesis, actually chapter 2, when the man and the woman are created, we're told that they are, they are naked and not ashamed. As though that's odd, that you would be naked and not ashamed. And it is. We don't understand that. We, we, under, we, we see nakedness as shameful. To be out in public with no clothes on, for example, would be considered the height of shame. Why is that? Because we, we, we have fear of what others might do to us. And, and so the man and the woman who had lived in complete innocence for all of this time, when they broke fellowship with God, suddenly they, they began to doubt one another. Is, is, what might he do to me or what might she do to me? And so they, they, after sin, they recognized that they were naked and they sought to cover themselves and to hide themselves and to hide their shame. And that was born out of a threat, a threat that they both realized they posed to each other. Because here's the reality, friends. The truth is this. If I will go up against God to get what I want and I will seek to overthrow Him, I will not think twice about destroying you to get what I want. And so relationships between man and man, woman and woman, were broken. Because of that vertical relationship and the, the destruction it had suffered, so too our horizontal relationships have suffered. So now we have problems in marriage, problems with children, problems with parents, problems with governments, problems with nations. All of that is the outgrowth of our broken fellowship with God. But God has remedied that on the cross through Christ. And now according to Paul in Ephesians, he says that God through the, through the cross has broken down the dividing wall of hostility between us. So that now we can have peace with one another. Not only can we have peace with God, we can have peace with one another. So we can thrive in our marriages. We can thrive in our relationships with our family. We can thrive in our relationships with our fellow church members. In fact, Paul would say that's one of the characteristics of the church that sets it apart from the world is that we get along. Philippians chapter 2, he tells the church there, you need to be unified of one accord. All of that, he says. You need to be one in harmony. And he says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And then he demonstrates what Christ Jesus did in leaving heaven and coming to earth and humbling himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, in order for there to be un unity, there must be humility. And the gospel humbles us. It lowers us to, the, to, the, uh, to a level, level playing field at the foot of the cross. It humbles us. And, and, and so now I look at you and you look at me 
And we realize, you know what, there's nothing that any of you could ever do to me. There's nothing in this world that I could do to you that rivals what we have done to Christ. And yet, what did Christ do for us? He moved toward us in reconciliation. Therefore, if Christ can reconcile me to God despite my grievous sins and offenses, I can surely be reconciled to you despite your sins and offenses against me. And that's what's to set the church apart. That's what sets, that sets the Christian apart. That's what sets the Christian marriage apart, the Christian home apart, forgiveness and grace. Because we have peace with God, we can now have peace with one another. And then thirdly, peace in our hearts. This is most often what people think of when they think of peace. They think of peace in our hearts. I want, I want that peaceful, easy feeling. That can only come through Christ because our consciences will not be silenced. Our consciences will not be silenced. We all know deep in our heart of hearts that things are wrong in this world. And we know deep in our heart of hearts that in some way we have contributed to that problem. And so our consciences condemn us. Every man, woman, child born on the face of the earth is condemned by their conscience. Paul says in Romans 2 that the law was written on our hearts and it is constantly accusing us. Sometimes I drive down the interstate. You got to go out of Sussex County to get to an interstate, but I'll drive on the interstate. And sometimes I'm driving along and, and, uh, and I'm not really maybe noticing and every once in a while I'll see Jen, she'll, be, she'll, she'll do this, look to the speedometer, and suddenly my conscience starts to accuse me. Because the speed limit sign says 65 and I'm doing 70, 75, maybe a little faster than that, depending on the interstate. And suddenly I realize that I am out of sorts with the law. The sign says this is the law. And suddenly I'm out of sorts with the law and my conscience is accused. And of course I justify myself. I'm just going with the flow of traffic. But obviously that doesn't work when the officer pulls you over. My conscience stands accused. Where can, I, where, can you, where can you and I find a clear conscience? Where can we get our conscience silenced? Romans 8.1 There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, could not do. In other words, the law can't make you obey. The law can't clear your conscience. All the law can do is condemn you. That's all it can do. The law can't make you right. All the law can do is show you that you're wrong. But God has done what the law, weakened by our sinful flesh, could not do. Here's how He did it. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin... He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. All the law could ever do is condemn. Imagine what it was like to live in the Old Testament under the law, to know that you had to keep the law, and every time you broke the law, you had to offer sacrifices for your violation of that law. You could, you could never be fully assuaged of your guilt. In fact, when... when, when um, when Jesus comes, you remember in Matthew chapter 11, or Matthew chapter 23, uh, the, 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 the Pharisees, he accuses the Pharisees. Listen to what he says. This, this is um, uh, Jesus speaking. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Moses is the, the head of the law, as it were. The law was given to Moses. So the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. He's like the judge of Israel. So do, and, and see, so do and observe what they tell you, but not the works that they do. Listen, for they preach, but do not practice. And listen to how he describes their, the law. For they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with a finger. The law weighs us down. It makes us feel our guilt. It, it, it condemns us at every turn. But then comes Jesus. In Matthew chapter 11. He looks out at the people whom he in this passage calls the little children. And he says this to them. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus has come to fulfill the law. And He has fulfilled the law so that you and I are no longer held to account by that law. Now, the law is still in effect. All sinners will be judged by the law. But when you and I stand before God one day, He's not going to judge us according to the law. He's going to judge us as Christians according to Christ who fulfilled the law in our place. So not only will we stand before God one day and hear the words paid in full because your penalty's paid, we're also going to hear, we're also going to see a, a, a receipt for all the good works. Not that we did, but that Jesus did. He did what we could not do. He lived the perfect life. And so I carry with me a receipt, as it were, for all of his good works. And when my conscience accuses and condemns me, you know what I do? I pull out that receipt. Again in Romans 8, who shall lay a charge against God's elect? Who's going to press charges to those whom Christ has said, forgiven, paid in full? There are no charges to be held. Friends, that is how we have a clear conscience. Hebrews chapter 10, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, no one would enter the holy places except the priest. That was not to be done. And, he, and, and the writer of Hebrews tells us, now we could go boldly in where there only the priest could go. And he had, to, he had to do business with God before even he went in. He says, now we go boldly into the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Listen, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. When Satan tempts me to despair, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. Friends, that's the good news of the Gospel. It saves us from the judgment due us from God. It saves us to one another so that we can have fellowship with each other. And it saves us from the condemnation of a noisy conscience. Because we know that any sin that was nailed to that cross is gone. It's paid for. It's under the blood of Christ. Never to be held against us again. So if you're here this morning and you've not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I implore you to do that. This is what we celebrate at Christmas, that this child came to earth to, to live, to die, and be raised again and to ascend at the right hand of the Father for us. This isn't just a little romantic story for greeting cards. This is your story. This is my story. And it's a story that transforms the hearts and men, the hearts and minds of men and women everywhere. And you can experience the hope of Christmas this morning if you will put your faith and your trust in Him. Let's pray.